All right, so quite often we see gases mixed together. And thanks to Mr. Dalton, he figured out that each gas in an unreactive mixture, because if you mix gases that react, then you're going to have a chemical reaction occur. But if you have gases in an unreactive mixture, as far as pressure is concerned, they act as if they were the only gas. And so what we end up seeing is that when we mix gases together, their pressures add up together. So if you have some oxygen at a pressure of 159 millimeters of mercury, and then you've got nitrogen at 593 millimeters of mercury, when you mix them together, you end up with the combined pressure, pretty much like the atmosphere around us right now. Most of the atmosphere is nitrogen and oxygen with some trace other gases. All of their partial pressures add up together to give us our total pressure. And so on the AP packet, you'll see this lovely equation that your total pressure for a mixture of gases is simply the addition of all their partial pressures. And so here's a couple of simple practice problems. How would you find the total pressure of a mixture containing the four gases? You would simply add up those pressures. That would be the combined pressure, the total. If you're given the total and you want to find the pressure of one of the gases in the mixture. So here we have a total pressure of 30.4 kilopascals. Two gases in the mixture have those pressures, 16.5 and 3.7. The third gas is carbon dioxide. How would you find that? Total minus the other contributors. And so you see that carbon dioxide must be contributing 10.2 kilopascals of pressure. Same thing here, just kind of drawn out. But if you've got hydrogen mixed with helium, total pressure is 600 millimeters of mercury. The partial pressure of helium is 439. So again, we can see that we can derive how much of the pressure is coming from the hydrogen gas in the mixture. All right. Perhaps you might see a visual representation. And so they might ask you, OK, recognize here in container A, there's a pressure of 200 kilopascals of pressure. Over in container B, what's the pressure? Well, they want you to recognize that in container A, there are six molecules of gas, whereas in container B, there's only three. Half as many particles, half as much pressure. And then if you would mix these gases together, then you would simply have the addition of their pressures. So sometimes, especially on that multiple choice part, they'll give you simple picture diagrams like this so you can very quickly figure out pressures relative to each other when they use small amounts of particles. Now, when you really think about it, partial pressures for gases are really an expression for gas concentration. So if you've got gas A, and I look at the pressure of that gas and the moles of that gas, because moles of gas and pressure are related. We just kind of looked at that. More particles, more pressure. Rearranging that, the pressure, the partial pressure of gas A is simply the moles of A divided by the volume. What's moles per volume, moles per liter? That's molarity, kind of a concentration. And then we've just got the temperature factor and that R factor. But at the heart and soul, these par partial pressures are really an expression for gas concentration. And oftentimes, the composition of a gas mixture can be expressed in mole fractions. And that's symbolized by a capital X, usually. And so if we had gas A in a mixture, the mole fraction of that gas would be how many moles of gas A are there divided by total number of moles. And you could also look at it through the eyes of pressure because we have that relationship between the pressure of a gas and moles that's proportional. OK, so how might we use this? Here we have a 1 liter flask containing 1.031 grams of oxygen and 0.572 grams of carbon dioxide. It's at 18 degrees Celsius. Lots of questions here. What's the partial pressure for oxygen and carbon dioxide in atmospheres? What's the total pressure in the flask? And what's the mole fraction of oxygen? All right, so sensing pivnert, we've got an amount of gas, we've got a volume, we've got a temperature. I don't like those grams, so we're going to have to switch those. And so for each gas, hopefully you can see, we'll change to moles 
put into the Pivnert equation, and that will give us our pressure for each gas. So for oxygen, 1.031 divided by the molar mass, 32, tells me how many moles of oxygen I have. Plug and chug away into Pivnert, and I find that pressure, the partial pressure of oxygen is 0 0.770 atmospheres. It asks for atmospheres, that's why I used 0 0.0821. And of course, 291 Kelvin is the 18 degrees Celsius plus 273. I do the same thing for carbon dioxide. I have 0.572 grams divided by its molar mass, 44. Now I know the moles, plug and chug, 0.331 atmospheres. So those are the partial pressures for oxygen and carbon dioxide. Total pressure, add it up. 0 0.770 plus 0 0.331, 1.081. And now the mole fraction. Well, we already know how many moles of oxygen there are and how many moles of carbon dioxide. If I add those two numbers up, then my total moles is 0 0.04522. Total. Now it asks for the mole fraction of oxygen. So in order to do that, oops, sorry. I simply take the moles of oxygen, 0 0.03222, divided by the total that we just figured out, 0 0.04522, and I just leave it as a unitless expression. The mole fraction of oxygen is 0.7125, 71.25% oxygen in this mixture. Now the most useful and practical application of Dalton's Law is when we collect gas over water. Okay, and this happens quite often in the lab. But of course, we don't collect gases that dissolve very rapidly in water because otherwise we wouldn't be able to collect them that well. But we'll do this in lab. And, sorry, I keep forgetting to turn my pen off. Basically what's happening is you're going to create a gas, it bubbles through water, and it collects on top of the water. But as it goes through the water, it picks up some water vapor, and that partial pressure is dependent only on temperature. We can look it up on a table, and we can subtract it out from our measured pressure in the lab. So how does that look? Here we see zinc reacting with hydrochloric acid, and when this happens, 156 milliliters of the hydrogen gas is collected over water, and this is at 19 degrees Celsius. And the Atmospheric pressure, the total pressure in the lab, is recorded as 769 millimeters of mercury. So ultimately, what is the mass of this hydrogen gas that's collected? Well, first off, the water vapor is dependent upon temperature, the water vapor pressure. And so we have these um, tables out there, and you see yours in, the, in your packet. So at 19 degrees Celsius, the vapor pressure of water is 16.5 torr, or millimeters of mercury. So I need to adjust the overall total pressure. So 769 is what was recorded. I subtract out the 16.5 from that table, and then using sig figs, that gives me the pressure of 753 millimeters of mercury. And so now I can use that in an effort to figure out the mass of hydrogen collected. Well, I get mass from moles, I have a pressure, I have volume, I have temperature, Pivnert. So I want to find the moles of this hydrogen collected, so plugging in my numbers, 753 is my new pressure, 0.156 liters, I had to change my 156 milliliters into 0.156 liters, 62.36 is my R value for Tor, or millimeters of mercury, and then my temperature of 19 degrees Celsius is 292 Kelvin. So I end up finding 0 0.00645 moles of hydrogen gas was collected. I want grams, so I just have to multiply by the molar mass, 2.0 grams per mole for my diatomic hydrogen. 0.0130 grams of hydrogen was collected. 
All right, so this is the type of problems and situations we'll look at in the lab in order to take care of, uh, we'll be collecting, similar, we'll be collecting hydrogen over water, but these are the calculations you'll be looking to, to apply Dalton's law into the laboratory situation. And ultimately what we're going to try and do is figure out how they found the R value, the ideal gas law constant. All right, see you soon.